In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we will pray the collect for this coming Sunday as our opening prayer. O God, who show the light of your truth to those who go astray, so that they may return to the right path, give all who for the faith they profess are accounted Christians the grace to reject whatever is contrary to the name of Christ and to strive after all that does it honor. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A short reflection on this coming Sunday's Liturgy of the Word. It is already 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time, and as you all know, we are in year B, uh, and in year B we reflect and hear from the Gospel of St. Mark. However, because Mark is the shortest of all Gospels, in the middle of the summer in year B, so that's every three years, uh, we are going to have what I like to call a retreat with John 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6, the Bread of Life Discourse. And in two weeks time, that's what we are going to do. Our Gospel readings for a few weeks will not be taken from Mark, but they will be taken from St. John the Evangelist. We will reflect on the Bread of Life. But for now, we are still in Mark, and our Gospel, I just want to share with you a few words, a few reflections, thoughts about uh, the Gospel and the first reading and uh, a little bit about the Psalm, um, and maybe one sentence about the second reading for this coming Sunday. Our Gospel is from chapter 6 of Mark, and it begins with like that. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. This sentence is packed with meaning and profound theological insight. So of course, we can speak of vocation because uh, the, the, the verb that we have is that Jesus summoned the twelve. I love that word summoned. Usually when it is used in the context of the school, when I was a boy and I was being summoned to the principal's room, it meant something bad, that I was going to be reprimanded. Uh, but it is really a call. When you are summoned, you are being called. So Jesus summons the twelve, he calls them. It is one of the most profound things of our uh, spiritual Christian life, that it is not us that choose God. We do, but it is secondary. First, God chooses us. There is always the primacy of grace. Jesus later in John will say to the disciples, It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you. You know, very often in the RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults, I love to hear stories of people who um, tell me of their call, of their uh, vocation, of their invitation from Jesus to become Catholics. And many of them are very right to recognize that even though they are making a decision to uh, become Catholic, to accept the faith, they were first summoned and called by Jesus. Our faith is always given to us from the outside. We cannot manufacture it from the inside. Nobody can baptize himself or herself. We receive the faith. And even those who may come to the faith through their study or reading of the scripture, they too receive the faith from other people through 
the testimony either of sacred scripture or of the philosophers, of theologians, of people of the faith. Faith is, we need these, I like to say, middlemen, you know, those people who, who bring us to God through whom we receive the message of the gospel. And you can think about in your life, who are these people who have brought you to Jesus, to faith? Uh, in my case, it was my family. I was 27 days old when I was baptized. So I received my faith through my parents and my family. So Jesus summoned the twelve. So reflection on the vocation and call. We are called by Jesus. And then we read that he began to send them out. I love that vo verb, to send. It, uh, the word apostle comes from that. Those who are sent by Jesus are, are apostles. So what is it? Jesus brings us to him. He summons us, but not so that just we can stay with him and enjoy his presence, but immediately we are sent out. Uh, the church is apostolic. We are to be apostles of the faith. We are to share it with other people. The church is missionary by its very definition. So we are first summoned to be with the Lord and then we are sent out to preach. They are sent out two by two. Well, maybe because Jesus wants them to be humble. He doesn't want them to be lone rangers. So they are supposed to go in pairs to preach the gospel. And he gives them, we read, authority over unclean spirits. It is a very profound statement here because Right from the start, Jesus tells the apostles that they are going to preach the gospel to a dysfunctional world. A world that is wounded by sin, it's under the dominion of Satan and unclean spirits. It's very real, very realistic approach. They are going to a world that will not always be willing to listen to the message world under the dominion of Satan. And in Mark's Gospel, you have to pay attention because in Mark's Gospel, right from the beginning, Jesus goes to the desert, is tempted by the devil, and then his first miracles, right when he starts his ministry, he already has to face evil of the world. Right in chapter 3, almost in the beginning of Mark's Gospel, the leaders of the people already plot in order to kill him. So they are sent not to a world that is going to be always willing to listen to them, but a, a world that is over the dominion of the evil and clean spirits, but they have authority over them. They, they go with the power of God uh, in order to, to preach the gospel with divine power. So that's the first sentence. They are called, summoned, and they are sent out with the authority over the unclean spirits. The, those evil spirits who are not God, they are not as powerful as God. They have power over them, the power from Jesus. Let's go on. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick, no food, no sack, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals, but not a second tunic. So it's basically one sentence about it. It's uh, the invitation of Jesus to completely rely on him in our mission. Not to rely on our own strength, but completely rely on him in our poverty. Uh, not counting on human ingenuity, but really uh, relying on uh, the power of Jesus as we are sent out to proclaim the gospel. It's very interesting here that he tells them to wear sandals. Uh, I found out that uh, those in, in ancient times, people who didn't wear sandals were slaves. So Jesus sends them out as free people. They are to wear sandals, walk in freedom, and to proclaim the gospel. And then he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Whatever place does not welcome you or listen to you, leave there and shake the dust of your feet in testimony against them. 
this sentence is so important for us because Jesus wants us to be realistic. When you proclaim the gospel in your life, every Christian is called to be an apostle, to uh, witness to the gospel in the world. So when you do it, you have to be rea realistic with yourself that not always you are going to be welcomed and not always you are going to be listened to. On the contrary, very often people will not uh, be willing to welcome you or listen to you. I mean, as an example, imagine today going to a secular school or out there to the public square and try to pro proclaim the Christian vision of human sexuality. You'll see how welcomed you are with that, with that vision. Most of the time you're going to be vehemently rejected. You're going to be considered uh, medieval, not realistic. People will not be willing to listen to you. But Jesus tells the disciples, if that happens, if you are not listened to, if they reject you, don't worry about that. Don't dwell on it. He tells them, shake the dust of your feet. Don't, don't worry too much about it and move on. There are other people who will hear, who want to hear the gospel. The, the missionary is constantly on the, on the way, going and proclaiming whether he is listened to or not. So that's a very consoling word to us. Uh, not sometimes we worry too much, you know, when we are, nobody likes to be rejected, of course. Nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody likes to be, you know, um, uh, dismissed. But that often happens in life. That's part of being a Christian. Uh, just think of the martyrs in the history of the church. How many of them had to give the ultimate witness of the testimony of their life for their, their faithfulness of the gospel. So don't, don't dwell on it. Uh, if you were not listened to, if when you preach, proclaim the gospel, uh, you're not welcome, then go and continue your mission. Don't dwell on it too much. And now finally, the, the ending. So they went off and preached repentance. How important that is. The first message of the gospel is the call to repentance. In fact, in, Math, in Mark, the first sentence that comes out from Jesus' mouth is repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. So that metanoia, the change of mind, repentance, they are supposed to preach. So the twelve drove out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. So that's the mission of, of the twelve. Only Mark, by the way, as a footnote here, only Mark mentions anointing with oil of all the synoptic, of all the Gospels. Only Mark says that. But also in James, letter of James, you have James talks about if there are any sick who are among you, let them send for the priests of the church and let the priests pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The Council of Trent has used these two statements of the scripture here in Mark and in the letter of St. James as a foundational uh, theme for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, the old extreme unction one of the seven sacraments. Uh, of course, many Protestants, you know, rejected almost all the sacraments except baptism and the Eucharist. But here you have the direct proof from the scripture in Mark and James about the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Let's now uh, say just a few words about the first reading that, of course, is always connected to the gospel. It comes from the prophet Amos or Amos. And uh, this is prophet Amos is one of the oldest prophets. He preached in 8th century BC. And very interesting here uh, in that reading, let me just uh, quote it. Amaziah, priest of Bethel, said to Amos, Off with you, visionary, flee to the land of Judah. There earn your bread by prophesying, but never again prophesy in Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and the royal temple. Amos answered Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor have I belonged to a company of prophets. I was a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores, 
the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. So that's a short first reading from uh, the prophet Amos. Now a little background here so you better understand. As I said, it was the, one of the oldest prophets, uh, prophet Amos. He is from Judah. You know, remember that after the death of the king Solomon, the son of David, the kingdom split. The ten northern tribes were Ephraim or Israel, and the two southern tribes were the kingdom of Judah. So there was a division in the country. And the northern kingdom very quickly went into idolatry because the king uh, Jeroboam built uh, two sanctuaries. Uh, one of them was in Bethel, uh, which basically, uh, instead of people going to Jerusalem to worship the true God in the temple, they were uh, started to go into idolatry. And Amos is actually from the south. He's from Judah, but he's sent by God to go to the north to, to uh, call them to repent and to come back to God. It was right before the Assyrian conquest of uh, the northern kingdom in the year 722 BC, when Assyria came in and destroyed the north and took the ten tribes into exile. Uh, one of the things that Amos is going to be so uh, very uh, power, uh, uh, critical about is the social justice aspect of the inequality between rich and poor the poor are being neglected. He will use the image of ivory beds, beds made of ivory in the city of Samaria, when people are just enjoying their life and not thinking about those who are less fortunate. But here, when he goes to preach to the north, from the south, this uh, Amaziah, a priest of Bethel, the sanctuary that Jeroboam built, he tells him, you know, stop preaching here, get out. We don't want you here. We don't want to hear you. You know, uh, go go where you came from. And Amos answered, I am not really a prophet because I'm just a dresser of sycamores and a shepherd. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So again, this idea that a prophet, an apostle, an evangelist, receives the call from God. The call that comes from outside, God calls him to do it. Therefore, he cannot say no to that voice and order that comes from God. He has to go and to proclaim the, the, the message of repentance to the people in the north. So Amos will not stop because he is criticized. He uh, is told to get out, but he will continue to uh, be faithful to the mission that he received from God. That's an example for us. Again, what I said in the first part of my reflection, if they criticize you, reject you, don't worry too much. If you have a mission from, from God, continue to be faithful and continue to, to preach the gospel. And then our psalm is Psalm 85 when we will sing, Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. What we are about is recognizing the salvation that has been offered to us by God. And that's what the gospel is. That's what the mission of the church is, is to preach to the world the salvific message of God. Uh, so that's our um, first reading, the gospel and the psalm. And of course, uh, this Sunday we will begin reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. It's a beautiful, very dense um, scriptural text, a hymn. But there is one line there that speaks of this uh, idea of being chosen when Paul says, In him you were also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intention of his will, so that you might exist for the praise of his glory. It's a beautiful line. We were chosen and destined to be with God according to the purpose of his will. So again, Paul wants us to think about our election. We who are baptized were chosen by God to be uh, 
conduits of God's grace in the world and proclaimers of the message of the gospel. So may God bless you in this uh, today's Friday afternoon. It's a little cooler today, thanks be to God, but it's going to be hot again. So in these summer months, remember that you are not taking a vacation from your call. We cannot take a break from what we are. We are Christians. We are anointed. We are sent. We are summoned by Jesus to go out and to witness to, to our faith. So may God bless you in your work of evangelization. Take care. Thank you.